You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only. Hello, this is Eric Topol for Medscape's Medicine and the Machine podcast, and we've got a real uh, exciting one today because we're going to have Dr. Randy Olson speak with us. Uh, Randy is uh, was a recovering marine biologist uh, with his uh, PhD from Harvard, who then t- almost 25 years ago uh, received his master's in fine art from the University of Southern California as, uh, in cinematics in a film school, perhaps the best film school in the United States. And since then, he has become one of the great communicators in this country. So we're going to be talking to him about uh, not just the pandemic, but science and medical communication. So welcome, Randy. Uh, thanks, Eric. Great to be here. Well, you know, I didn't know about you. I have to say I'm ashamed. I didn't know about you until just recently when you gave a lecture at Scripps on science communication. And it was really extraordinary because you took uh, some of our postdocs and their statement about what do they do for their project, and you kind of rewrote it. So that it became a lot more exciting and interesting. And you did that repetitively. And then I realized that you are a real master in science communication. Previously, I had interacted a fair amount with Alan Alda and his efforts. Maybe you could comment about what's different about your kind of your take, your ABT template, and what you know about the Alda uh, communication effort. I think those guys are great. And, um, you know, he's given a real gift to the world of science um, just in his endorsement of or bringing his brand name to the improv training for science. And that's a very important tool in communications training. I, for probably 25 years, worked with the Groundlings Improv Comedy Theater in Hollywood. As soon as I got out of film school, I really connected with them and knew that they were a major resource. And in fact, Worked with about 25 of their actors, cast them in different short films I, I was doing, uh, always searching in hopes of finding one that had really a kind of deeper, almost also intellectual side uh, interested in what I was doing. And I finally found it in the form of Brian Palermo, who's one of their veterans, who's uh, both actor, was kind of part of Jay Leno's show and cast and lots of other shows he was on. And he, I cast him in a film and he came up and said, any chance we could go to lunch someday and you could tell me about this marine biology stuff that you did? I'm really interested in that. He graduated from, uh, I think, um, let's see, University of New Orleans. And so I recruited him and he started working with me in uh, doing the improv side of the communications training. And in 2013, uh, along with this other improv instructor, or, or sorry, narrative instructor, we had Dory Barton, the three of us co-authored a book called Connection. Um, Hollywood storytelling and critical thinking. And I've been working with Brian now for 12 years. He's part of my ABT framework program now that we do. He's one of the 15 to 20 people that help run these courses that we're in the 24th round of it. And that is what makes different that I'm doing, which is that uh, I have a model and nobody else has a model for narrative structure. And narrative is at the core of how we communicate, not just in recent years, but going back thousands of years. And at the core of everything that I've tried to teach is I came to Hollywood 27 years ago with this belief that Hollywood knows better than anywhere else how to communicate to the masses. And I was searching for what's the one thing I could find at the core of it all. And I found it. It's this ABT template. And it turns out it's nothing that Hollywood came up with. It really goes back to the um, three or 400 years ago to the philosophers, Kant and Hegel and all of them. It's called the triad back then. And it's at the core of how we communicate. Um, it's gotten obfuscated and obscured over the ages. And in the last century in particular, as we generated so much information in our society, we've lost these core simple principles. And that's a lot of what I'm preaching is it's time for us to get back to this element of simplicity at the core of communication. Because, you know, there's a book that's come out recently that's, uh, I think, a bestseller titled Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention by Johan Hari. And that's yet another book. Uh, Ten years ago, there was The Shallows and then books before that about what's been going on throughout my lifetime and yours, which has been the glutting of information and the consequence in terms of reduced attention span and focus. And that's the real ailment that we have now. Uh, And so that's the problem. And ABT is at least a part of the solution. 
Now, so for the um, medical audience, Medscape, uh, biomedical, healthcare professionals, uh, they, of course, need to know what the A and the B and the T stand for. So maybe you could give a quick review on that one. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the starting point is to understand there's two ways to communicate, non-narrative and narrative. Non-narrative is simply spewing out information without any problem solution that it's built around. And that's the default way. That's what most everybody starts their communication with. Um, with more effort, you can work that material into narrative communication. And that's where you build it around a problem solution dynamic. And at that point, there's three parts to it. There's the setup, there's the problem, and there's the actions or solutions that are being taken. That's what the ABT is. The, the three words, and, but, and therefore, are just the most common words for putting that into action in our language. But the, uh, they really embody the three forces of narrative, which are agreement, contradiction, and consequence. This is how we communicate all day long, everybody, uh, everywhere. And this becomes a very simple template of ABT, easy to remember, to remember, and to put to use. And it applies to everything. And so, you know, for example, in your laboratory, might be the case that you've been studying, you know, a, a gene for that's been studied for 50 years, and we've learned this and this and this. But the one aspect of that gene that nobody's ever really been able to figure out is this thing. Therefore, you're now doing the following projects. And every single project falls into that template of ABT. And that's what we do in the, the training now. Yeah, now that's what I think we know storytelling is really important. But what you're providing is a template to tell the story. Um, and I think that's so vital. Now, let's shift to the pandemic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this has been a historic botch job in communication <laughs> led, by the, <laughs> led by the CDC and other public health agencies. <laughs> and you kind of give us a critique of how um, there wasn't a very good communication and storytelling along the way. Well, you know, you've given me the gift um, already, a head start on that which is your last episode or the episode you did in mid-December, which anybody listening to this one, I, I wish you could stop right now and go back and listen to that one before we even go any further. It was your discussion with Andy Slavitt about the pandemic. And of all the things I've listened to in the past two years about the pandemic, that may be the very best discussion I've heard. You, the three of you, you, Abraham and Andy Slavitt, first off, the tone was so perfect. You were so somber. And he was so honest. What a great guy. And he didn't show up in your podcast and put up some facade about, we're really proud of the job we did. No, he was so honest. He just said, we know we've blown it. And close to a million people have now died. And we've got to figure out some way to assess what's going on here. Now, you and I are both buddies with Mike Osterholm, the head right. of the, yeah, the, the University of Minnesota's Center for Infectious Diseases. And I got to know him uh, in October of 2020 at the start of the pandemic. He was on Meet the Press, and he's the only guy that I've heard talk about this part of the problem, which is that we've done a poor job communication and communication back then. Now, of course, everybody, you're right, all descended on CDC. But on that um, appearance on Meet the Press, what he said was, we're failing to communicate with a single voice, which has been the problem all along, just all these people contradicting each other. And he also said, we're failing to tap into the power of story and storytelling. So I immediately, you know, made a beeline to him through my contacts, at the CDC, asked him to please contact him. He ended up getting on the phone with me a couple of days later and may turn out to be his worst nightmare. We became buddies and <laughs> <laughs> began tons and tons of phone calls and discussions, some of which we locked horns. And I, and the sad thing is he's, he's still the very best. He's my hero in the whole pandemic. The one guy who pointed to the communication when nobody else was pointing to it. And the consequence was to cut back to the discussion you had with Andy Slavitt. The best thing you guys did of all of that whole great discussion was you ended by saying, what's the bottom line here? And he owned up to it. And he said, there's two things. First off, there is the science side of what went on. And I give ourselves an A or an A minus. And I completely agree with that. The scientists did heroic work. As we know, Michael Lewis was on me uh, on 60 minutes last year and with his book, Premonitions. And he hit the same note. You know, he told seven heroic stories in that book, but he said, it's not a time to celebrate. You know, despite all this hard work, we failed the public. Um, and yet the science definitely does deserve an A, A minus. But then he went on to the other element, which was he, you guys referred to it as social science. I'd broaden it out into just the social dynamic. 
And you guys agreed on the score of a D minus to an F. And there you go. You know, uh, why do you think it, it deserves a D minus or an F? Yeah, this is really important because there's so many factors here um, that contribute to a failed uh, communication. I don't know if I want to call it a strategy. It just uh, was just uh, poorly coordinated. One you touched on, Randy, which was there was infighting so that there was different uh, narratives for, by the White House saying, we're, oh, we're going to give boosters to everyone. And then the CDC and the FDA went against it. And they each were fighting about the, the White House response team with the NIH. And uh, they were on one side, the CDC and FDA was on another. And then every few days, the booster plan changed. You know, it went from, uh, we're going to have everyone get a booster to, well, maybe not everybody, but maybe in eight months, or maybe in five months, no, maybe six months. And it was mass confusion. And we've never recovered from that. We're at 20 some percent boosters where there are countries that are you know, 65%. And we know that's really important, both for Delta, Omicron, and the waning of immunity. Now, that's just one part of that, is the, is the, the contradictions and the confusion. I think the communication isn't clear. Like, I'll give you an example. Recently, the CDC has been putting on their website, the uh, finally, after much uh, prodding, uh, the effects on death and hospitalization by different age groups, okay? And uh, with a booster, without a booster, with no, no vaccination, you know, two shots. And they communicate it in very strange ways. <laughs> and and uh, I, I put down... <laughs> On, on Twitter, that's not a good thing. No, ninety nine percent reduction of death with vaccination and a booster. You know, ninety six percent a reduction in death uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. hospitalization with a booster across all age groups. Uh, simple, simple. Like anybody can get that, but yeah. they have the you know sixty two x this and that, and they don't. <laughs> just, okay, so, let, let me let me jump yeah. in at this point. Yeah. So I've got a few simple little quotes here to to share, and this, this is a really fundamental one. Um, in the course, we produced a book. I, I wrote a, a first book called The Narrative Gym. And then there's 15 to 20 people that helped me run this course that are from a number of other disciplines because the ABT applies everywhere across all disciplines. And so there's a fellow from the business world, Park Howe, who's the longtime host of a podcast called The Business of Story. He came across the ABT eight years ago and flipped over it and is now uses it day in and day out. So he looked at my narrative gym book and said, you know, nice book, but unless it has business on the cover, my business people aren't going to buy it. So we did a rewrite of the first and last chapters and made the narrative gym for business. Then same thing happened with the lawyer, Doug Passan, who works with us. He's a great lawyer that has been written up in the New York Times a couple of times. He co-authored the law version of it with me. And then Dave Gold, veteran Democratic Party polit political strategist, did the same thing and co-authored the po politics version with me. And we start that book with this quote from Barack Obama, who, you know, is my favorite president of in recent memory. At the beginning of his second term, he was asked this simple question, which is, what would you say was the biggest shortcoming of your first term? And here's what he answered. The mistake of my first couple of years was thinking that this job was just about getting the policy right. And that's important. But the nature of this office is also to tell a story to the American people. So if we take a look and dissect this out, what he's saying there matches completely with your two grades of A for the science, F for the, the implementation. He's talking about in the beginning, he says, I thought that this job was just about getting the policy right. That's the information side. That's what the science folks did. And they got the information right. They nailed it on the vaccines. But he goes on to say, but the nature of this office is also to tell a story to the American people. That's where the whole COVID project fell apart. There wasn't that effort. There wasn't an understanding of how equally important it is to once you get the knowledge of the vaccine to figure out how you're going to get the public to actually do this. And it became a big shock when they started to roll it out and found out that a third of the public just said, we're not taking your, your vaccine. And more importantly was for me, um, poor old Mike Osterholm, who had to put up with all these horrible phone calls from me where I just kept calling him up and say, what, what's going on? Because he was on that uh, advisory council from the beginning, the 13 mostly epidemiologists they assembled who were superstars and they expanded to 16 and they did their job. But I kept asking him, when are they putting together the equal and opposite council for the communication side? And the answer was never. They never did. And there's where it fell down. There's your F. There was not a concerted effort on that. And furthermore, 
I kept saying to him, I hope that when they do finally put together those 13 to 16 experts, that none of them have PhDs, that they all come from either Hollywood or from the advertising marketing world, where they have the intuition, the gut level stuff to connect with the masses. And you may recall in that talk I gave to your group there, Scripps, that I talked about the two presidents that were most impactful in my lifetime. The first one, John Kennedy, who represented the best and the brightest, that whole image of let's pull all the greatest minds in our society together to lead our society. And I thought that was how government was supposed to work until the third year I was in graduate school when this country elected the co-star of Bedtime for Bonzo, a B great actor named Ronald Reagan. And I despised him through all those years. But as the years went on, he developed the nickname of the great communicator. And what you came to realize was that he understood the power and importance of this communication stuff. And one little anecdote I'd thrown in there was that one of my friends from high school worked in the Reagan administration. And she said, yes, it was true. He knocked off work at five o'clock and he laughed at academics and called them eggheads. But every so often in the White House, you'd see a transcript of one of his speeches sitting there and they'd be covered with his handwritten comments. And it showed you that he took that one part of his job very seriously. He was a trained actor. He knew how important acting is. And it is communication, one and the same. And he put all his effort onto that, became the great communicator and had an enormous impact on this country, whether you like it or not. You know, he changed our society. He understood that need. And it wasn't, you know, he didn't have a PhD. There, there, there's got to be a partnership between the PhDs and the people that understand the communication and they're different groups and they've got to work together. And that did not happen at all. You know, in your, in your lecture, you uh, cited Michael Crichton, a physician, oh, yes, who was a great communicator, obviously, and like you, a filmmaker. Uh, and you actually, I didn't even remember, he had written a New England Journal article about communicating in medicine. Uh, so the themes here are, are very similar across, whether it's public health agencies, um, you know, for, for community science, uh, the, the progress in medicine and how to deal with people who aren't going to get a vaccine no matter what, trying to mitigate that concern. But also, um, there's then people who have become established, uh, like Joe Rogan, as a great podcaster, like number one. Like in the world, a two hundred million dollar man. Yeah. Now, our friend Mike Osterholm was <laughs> on his podcast uh, just last week. Okay, and uh, he was brought in after all the pressure of having people like Robert Malone and uh, Peter McCullough and others who were very much um, per, uh, miscommunicating. I would even say discommunication to try to get things straight. How did you you listen to that two and a half hour podcast <laughs> as I did? <laughs> Yeah. What, what what can you say about that and and uh, how how Mike and and Joe interacted? Mike is the bravest of communicators getting out there. Um but this stuff is warfare. And the, when you go on anybody's show, you're going into their arena and it's almost impossible for you to control the narrative. And that's what communication is about is controlling the narrative. And the ABT gives you a whole analytical way to look at it. But once you go into their arena, they're in charge. And the first half hour of that discussion, um, Joe Rogan kept bringing up the Wuhan lab escape idea. Mm -hmm. And Mike kept trying to, he kept saying over, there's no evidence, no evidence. And I wish he could have been more aggressive and just said, say, end of story. We're not going any further, but he didn't want to get into a spat with him. And I respect that. Um, but this is where you need where's the Jen Pasaki for the NIH? Where's the trained spokesperson to be out there, the flack to deal with that so that the scientists aren't having to do this stuff? Why in the world is Anthony Fauci out there defending himself in public on these attacks by Robert Kennedy Jr. and, and Rand Paul? There ought to be spokespeople that have got the, the training on how to control the narrative. And there are in Hollywood. I mean, I've worked with some of these publicists and they are animals. And it is a really vicious, aggressive arena that you've got to have the training to get in there because you've got to get the jump on him. You've got to control the narrative. You've got to get out ahead of stories. You've got to look out for their narrative voids. And one of the little rules that coined in, in all of these books, the narrative gym books, is something I call Shirley's Law. And Shirley Malcolm is my good buddy who's been the head of education for AAAS for many, many years. She's awesome. Uh, Mid-70s, Black woman grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. We, she and I are soulmates for the last 15 years. And early on, she would say this thing to me, which is, if you don't tell your own story, 
Somebody else is going to tell it for you, and you probably aren't going to like how they do it. And that has gone on over and over again for the Democratic Party. It happened with Michael Dukakis with the Willie Horton commercial. It happened with John Kerry with the Swift Vote veterans. It happened with Hillary Clinton with Trump calling her crooked Hillary. Over and over again, they've failed to have this ability to get out ahead and tell powerful stories on their own. And they've had other people tell the stories. And as the Hollywood publicist would say to you, you're chasing the bus at that point. You, the bus is already out. They've got the narrative. And once you're chasing the bus, you can't redirect it. You can't stop it. All you can do is try and come up with another narrative that might compete with it. But there's just none of this discussion. And the single biggest message, if I had for the whole Biden administration and for Andy Slavin, all of them, is you want to know where the golden chalice is? It's in chapter two of Robert McKee's book, Story in 1997. That is the gold standard for Hollywood storytelling. Robert McKee is the, the big guru in Hollywood. And chapter two is his whole account of the eight fundamental principles of classical design of stories, how they've been shaped for thousands of years. And this is what's not going on is any understanding that you're dealing with communication dynamics with the masses that have been programmed into the brain for thousands of years, going back to Gilgamesh, the first recorded stories. And I don't hear any of that discussion going on with all these people that are in charge of communication. And until that's going on, you're not going to get a handle on these things. And it's just, it, it's lacking as a perspective. And here's one tiny example of it, which was on Monday this week on Andy Slavitt's um, own podcast, he had Rochelle Walensky, the head of CDC on there. And within about three or four minutes, they began talking about uncertainty. And this comes up all the time, especially in the climate world. Well, if you read McKee's book there in chapter two, these eight characteristics of narrative, that's one of them, is complete causality. The mass audiences want complete certainty. It's called the omniscient narrator in the world of literature. There's a whole body and tradition. People, when they read novels, they don't want to hear a narrator that's telling them a story. I think this happened in Alaska. Maybe it was in Argentina. I don't really know where it happened. They disconnect at that point. They want complete confidence. And there's the hole in the whole system which opens the door to all these conspiracy theories. Have you ever heard anybody offer up a conspiracy theory with probabilities? No, you know, that's the whole thing. It's a con man. It's, we have this weakness. The masses have this weakness towards confident voices because that's what they seek is complete confidence. And the science world just does, is not even aware of that as a constraint. But that's where it all begins is understanding the landscape out there and that you've got to shape your communication dynamics around the way the masses think you can't just yell at them. Here's the facts. It just, you know, again, an A versus an F. That was such a good synthesis you guys did. There's your your marching orders, that F. Well, you've already touched on some of the cardinal aspects. I mean, what you really, besides being a filmmaker and a, a, a marine biologist, what you really have done is understand the science. I mean, there really is a science of communication. And a lot of the things that you've just cited, uh, really uh, represent that, reflect that. Now, what's really uh, amazing to me, I mean, you, you, it, it, whether it be the storytelling in ABT, whether it's getting ahead of the story, whether it's um, dealing with certainty uh, and knowing what is going to resonate and not resonate or lead to holes in stories that are going to be filled in by conspiracy theorists or whatever, whoever, uh, why I, I don't understand why the CDC and the FDA, the White House response team, has not called you in to help them. <laughs> really. I mean, oh, I, really. uh, well, OK, uh, that's a really great question. First off, my first book was titled Don't Be Such a Scientist in 2009, which is a fairly aggressive title. And even before it came out, a lot of people on blogs were saying this is so negative. But it came out and got solid reviews in Science and Nature. And one of the biggest treats I got was in August of 2010, a group of communications folks at the CDC invited me to come spend a very lengthy day. It was the first of five visits I did there. But that first day was monumental. And the day began in the morning with me meeting with Tom Frieden, who was the director then. Um, he, as I walked in his office, he was holding up my book and saying, this is not the way to do it. This is too negative. Um, <laughs> we sat there. It was supposed to be a 10 minute meeting. It was a half an hour of locking horns. And, you know, from the outset, but all the communications people that what they had said to me, and I'll try and be polite about this, but I had a conference call with them the week before. And they said, you have the Harvard PhD, you are a postdoc, you got tenure, you had the big NSF grant, maybe they'll listen to you because they will not listen to anything we try and tell them on how this communication stuff is so important. 
And that day they set me up for three meetings each time with like 20 to 30 scientists in a room. And one of them turned into a pretty much of a shouting match as I was telling them, you have got to work with these communications people because if you don't, there's this growing anti-science movement. I made those two movies about the attacks on evolution science and climate science. I saw it all amassing. I couldn't believe it when I... It, there was an article in the New Yorker in May of 2005 called Devolution. And that was about this $5 million budget, the Discovery Institute to fund these efforts to try and get this intelligent design repackaging creationism into science classrooms. And creationists back when I was in graduate school doing my biology PhD were a laughable marginal movement, but now it's moved on. And in fact, a month ago, the Washington Post had an article about that big rally they had there of the anti-vaccination folks. And in that article, here's what they said almost two years into the coronavirus pandemic, the movement to challenge vaccine safety and reject vaccine mandates has never been stronger. An ideology whose most notable adherents were once religious fundamentalists and minor celebrities is now firmly entrenched among tens of millions of Americans the the mobs are not just at the gate they're pouring into the science establishment they're rooting the palace and when will the science world understand that you're under assault and that's what was going on back then now as you know in 2010 the cdc was in its golden years there in the obama administration and that day i remember so clearly twice during that day uh people said to me you know, every year this survey comes out about the most trusted institutions in the government. And we're always number two because number one is Fort Knox. And we figure that's because it's got all the gold there. But after Fort Knox, we're the most trusted institution. And it's so sad to think back on that now because you're right. It's 12 years later and it's just a shambles of the things that unfolded. And it's just too bad because there needs to be that singular voice. And going back to the Michael Crichton mention. Um, that guy, this is so sad. The science world is so literal minded that they, they view anybody that leaves the ivory tower as irrelevant. So that's the answer to you. You know, why have I not been brought in these things? It's an endless battle. I thought that by going the whole distance and getting tenure and the big NSF grant, that would show everybody. And no, as soon as you leave the ivory tower, you're just labeled as, oh, that person washed out for one reason or another. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't go off to the stuff. And it was the same thing with Michael Crichton, which was he did the Harvard medical school, everything. He was a postdoc at the Salk Institute and then got pulled away to make hundreds of millions of dollars in Hollywood. And for 25 years, he offered back up his knowledge. And one of the last major gestures he did before he jumped the fence and became, albeit a climate skeptic at the end, which was really bad. I, I spent four months trading emails with him a year before he died. And, and he was off the deep end in a lot of ways by then. But previous to that, he did put in 25 years, make himself available to science and in 1999, he gave the keynote address at the AAAS meeting, and that speech is still online. You can find it. And it's a blueprint for how to deal with the anti-science movement from 1999, and it is current and relevant today as it was back then. Here's a couple short little excerpts from it. One of the things he said was, the information society will be dominated by groups of people who are most skilled at manipulating the media for their own ends. That was foretelling what happened with Trump and the idea of this this manipulating the media group. And then he talked about, you know, the way to deal with these attacks on the credibility of the science world is to develop these single authoritative voices for each discipline. And he talked about, he said, over time, build a news bureau of experts and turn it into a kind of good housekeeping seal. So that's something from our generation that today's youth don't even know what that was. But, you know, when we were growing up, there was this thing, the good housekeeping seal, which was the singular voice of validation. And that's what's been needed. But there was no plan. And when the pandemic broke out, there was there should have been a contingency plan, basically, about what are you going to do if we ever elect an anti-science uh, president? And that happened. And Trump, you know, within days of coming in there, took us out of the Paris Accord. How bigger of a flair did you need that you've got an anti-science president? Never got, never had a science advisor, just scoffed at the whole science world. And I don't understand why there isn't more, but I do understand it because when I did the my film Flock of Dodos, I was involved with the people in Kansas who were trying to beat back this intelligent design movement. In the summer of 2006, the Discovery Institute was pouring money into Kansas to support these people running for the school board that were openly, avowedly pro-intelligent design to undermine evolution. And I kept writing emails to people at National Academy of Science and AAAS, specifically Bruce Alberts, the head of National Academy of Science, eventually wrote back. And I said, why aren't you 
guys out here with your millions of dollars helping to defend science. And they all just said, we don't do that. That's politics. We don't get engaged in that. We're science organizations. We promote science. Well, now it, the, the barbarians are flooding in through the gate and there hasn't been a plan and there still isn't a plan. And last little thing to say on, you know, how bad it is, just one little symptom of it. Um, soon as they got going with the, the Biden team, they began holding these press conferences on TV. And you look at the graphics from those things and what you see, there's three characters there. There's Anthony Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, and I think Andy Slavitt or uh, Zeintz eventually. But you don't do that. Read the book, The One Thing, a best-selling book from the business world about people need the singular narrative. You have one spokesperson. You don't put three on the screen. Yeah. You're confusing people from the outset. And then, as you know, that, yes, mixed yes. signals. Oh, my goodness. Such fundamental little lack of, and it's a lack of intuition. And that's the problem is too many PhDs in the, in the kitchen. I'm sorry, but the PhDs have got to get out of the room when it comes to this communication stuff. It's the Hollywood people. And it's laughable when you're in Hollywood. You know, they laugh at, at film school graduates and the highly educated. You can't do everything with an advanced education. There are some things in our society you can't do so well, and you've got to respect that. Well, you know, you are a gem, Randy. And I hope that maybe some of the people in our public health agencies who are still trying to manage this pandemic will, will hear this. Well, I, I, so I'll say two things on that. First off, I don't think Mike Osterholm at this point would agree with you on the, the gem aspect. We had a phone call on Saturday that <laughs> once again, we locked horns, but- uh, Oh, that's know, okay. Cause it, it'll, it'll- He's awesome. It, yeah. You know, look, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're basically indirectly coaching him for his next appearance on Meet the Press or wherever. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you know, have a very, you know, great impact on people to try to get the story, get ahead of it, get it right, you know, get it so that people really uh, listen to it and have an impact. That's what this is about. Can I, can yeah. I add one last tidbit here um, about, it's for your, your co-host, uh, Abraham yeah. uh, Verghese and uh, his wonderful book, The Tennis Partner. So the, the ABT template originates, as far as I can tell, with Frank Danielle, one of the great screenwriting instructors who was at USC when I got there. I took the script analysis course. And in 86, he gave a speech. And in this speech, there's two paragraphs that are the, the source for the ABT dynamic. And the first paragraph, what he says very simply is, monotony is a problem in first drafts. He's talking about screenwriting, but it applies to everything. There's several reasons for it. One usually is the fact that the scenes follow in the forbidden pattern of and then dot, 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 and then dot, 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 and then dot, dot, dot. That's how people start telling stories. And it's in the revisions that you start to get the buts and the therefores in there that turn into a story. Well, what I just loved was I loved um, Abraham's book, The Tennis Partner. Um, I'm an avid tennis player myself, so I just ate it up. But on page 30, he tells this great little anecdote. He came home one night and his two kids, ages five and seven, were telling him the whole story of the latest episode of Batman Robin. And the seven-year-old was telling the story, but every so often he would pause. And as Abraham said, the five-year-old would jump in. And when he did, he would say, quote, and then dot, 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 and then dot, 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 and then dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and that just shows you at, a, at five years old, you're at that yeah. same place that everybody is with first drafts. You begin with that, with all the information. And what the ABT is about is then moving it further. And that's what comes with age. You've developed this ability to shape things into the story, the very story that Obama talked about that was his job as the president to tell a story of the American public. And it's about having that ABT structure to it. So that's how universal it is. And please tell him that I love that book, The Tennis Partner. I, I will. And I'm Such sorry he couldn't friend. join us today, but I know he's going to love hearing about <laughs> that. And I've loved hearing from you today. And I will look forward to more of that in the future. Randy, ABT, also, <laughs> you are, you know, we can all learn from you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great talking to you. Appreciate it.